what miracle were they looking for? They saw dangerous dimensions of God. But at the slightest opportunity, they bowed to bow. They committed adultery with Ashtaroth. Peace. Praise God. Matthew chapter 21, 28. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 28. Let's see what God will do with us today. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. 30. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Next verse. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots entered the kingdom of God before you. Next verse. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Praise God. Before I go into the meat of what it is that God wants me to share this morning, let's put this scripture in context. What exactly was happening here? What was at play in this portion of scripture? First of all, Jesus speaks about a man having two sons. Now, if you are a student of the Bible, you will know that in scriptures, there are metaphors and there are parables. They are not the same thing. A metaphor is used for descriptive purposes. It is used to provide symbols for something you are trying to communicate. So a metaphor is representative in nature. A metaphor is symbolic in nature. So you use something as a representation of another thing. That's a metaphor. A parable, on the other hand, can include a metaphor, but a parable is not necessarily a metaphor. Are you with me? So a parable is a story that is told to give insight to a spiritual truth. That's a parable. So with a parable, you are telling a story to give insight, to reveal, to bring understanding to a spiritual truth. That's what a parable does. But it is woven in a story. A metaphor does not really need a story to tell it. It just needs an object. So what Jesus is doing here is that he's sharing a parable. Now if you're a student of the New Testament, you will know that in telling parables, the idea of telling a parable, even though the parable is to reveal a spiritual truth, was that Jesus wanted to conceal the truth from those who did not value it. Are you with me? So, those who were qualified to understand the parable were those whom Jesus had seen that they valued what it is he was trying to communicate. So even though by design the parable was supposed to reveal spiritual truth, but Jesus communicated to the men of that age in parables because he wanted to conceal the spiritual truth. And what I'm saying to you is not a figment of my imagination. It is what Jesus himself said. So if we go to Matthew chapter 13, it should be Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, give me verse 10. I think, Matthew 13 and verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Who is them? His audience. The people who were listening to him. Why, why do you speak to them in parables? The disciples were concerned. Look at Jesus' response. He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them, it has not been given. Next verse. 
For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, this may be complicated. Because King James can make things very complicated. Give me the message translation. The message translation. Are you seeing that now? Whenever someone has a ready heart for this, what is this? Truth. Spiritual realities. Whenever someone has a ready heart for truth, when someone has a value for the spiritual things I'm trying to communicate, the insights and understandings do what? Flow freely. So the reason is not as if Jesus was a bad man. That he just decided to select a few people to unveil the mysteries. The reason those people, it was not given unto them to know the mysteries of the kingdom was the matter of their heart. They were not ready for those insights. They didn't place a value on the things that Jesus was trying to communicate. You see, many people can hear the same teaching. But the same teaching will not have the same result in the life of everyone because of the posture of value. The main reason the average believer is not a student of the Bible, the main reason the average Christian does not have a Bible study life, that the only time he opens his Bible is when he comes to church and they say, open to chapter this verse that. He doesn't live consistently with a dedication and a discipline to the word of God. It's a matter of value. What you do not value, you will never pursue. What you do not value, you will never invest in. What you don't value, you will never treasure. It's a matter of value. So it is very easy to see what a man values by looking at his priorities. If you value something, you will prioritize it. The reason your Bible is under your bed and the only time you remember it is when it is a, a church day is because of value. But your mobile phone, if you are going to work and you forgot your mobile phone, you are sick, you immediately have fever. And even if you have reached Kasua, eh, and your house is in Greater Accra, and you have reached Kasua, you will, you, will, you will come back. Even if it takes you three hours, you can't survive without your mobile phone. But the average believer can go for 10 months without personal Bible study. It's a sickness. It's called the lack of value. And you see, value is not portrayed in what you mount from your lips. Value is portrayed by what your life is given to. If your life is given to it, we will know that you value it. We know that you value it. And you don't need to be angry with me. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself for it. So what Paul was trying to teach us is the proof of value is in sacrifice. That the reason Christ gave himself for the church was because of love and that love was a reflection of his value. Of his value. So Jesus was saying that the reason I cannot speak to these people in plain language so that they can easily enter into the things I'm trying to communicate is because I have discerned their hearts. And the discerning of their hearts was not just because Jesus was all-knowing as the omniscient one. It is because even in their actions, he could see that there was no value. He heals a man and they ask him, by what authority do you do this? For them, their concern was authority. He rides into Jerusalem on the back of a cult and everyone is shouting, this is the prophet from Nazareth, Jesus Christ. And yet, the ones who should have been custodians of the law to be able to identify that indeed, this was Jehovah's Messiah. Rather, they came to him and they began to question him. Do you hear what the people are crying? Hosanna, Hosanna. And Jesus was broken in his heart. He said, listen, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, the Lord has ordained praise. So even if you refuse to believe, even if you refuse to move in the direction of the move of God, 
God has raised babes. Those who are not learned, those who are not mature, those who don't even know the law, they are able to see that this is God's move. So even in their actions, Jesus could see that there was no value. So he said, unto them, the book is closed. But if there is a readiness, uh, but if there is no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. So there's a certain kind of readiness. There's a preparation. You know the ancients that taught us how to work with God? They told us that you don't go to programs anyhow. The people who taught us how to work with God. So I, I trained myself as I learned from the ancients that if I see the banner for a meeting and I'm going to attend that meeting, I will enter into a season of prayer, preparing myself for the meeting. In a meeting, there are two possibilities. The preacher can come with an anointing. And by the weight of his anointing, he can implicate you in what God wants to do. But the other possibility is that you can come from your closet with what is called the atmosphere of expectation. That atmosphere of expectation becomes a breeding ground for miracles. So everybody around you can be dry. Everybody around you may not be hearing what the preacher is saying, but your spirit, there's a crack in your spirit. And that crack is not accidental. You broke your spirit before you came. Have you read in Proverbs that the Bible says there's much food in the tillage of the poor? That is in the farm ground of the poor, there is more, much food. So the poor man's wealth is not in the abundance of goods. It's in the abundance of hard work. If he breaks his fallow ground, that ground, there is much fruit. But what he needs to do is to, to be able to break it. So certain individuals don't come into meetings carelessly. They come with what the Bible called a readiness. Once there is that readiness, there will be increased receptivity. Things will not fly over your head. That's why you can be in the same meeting with somebody and the preacher has not said anything fantastic and tears is falling from the person's eyes. You'll be tempted to ask the person, oh God, why you they cry? I beg, now that thing with the man. No, no, no. You people are not hearing the message from the same place. You are in the same location physically, but the person is on another plane in the spirit. It's called the place of readiness. Readiness. So the Bible says that where there is no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. Next verse, 13. That's why I tell stories to do what? Create readiness. To nudge the people towards receptive insight. In their present state, they can stare till doomsday and not see it. Listen till they are blue in the face and not get it. Next verse. I don't want Isaiah's forecast repeated all over again. Your ears are open, but you don't hear it. In. Your eyes are awake, but you don't see it. In. Next verse. The people have, are blockheads. They stick their fingers in their ears so they won't have to listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look. So they, don't want, they, they won't have to deal with me face to face and let me what? Them. So this is the reason the book was closed to them. Even though they had eyes, they could not see. Even though they had ears, they were not hearing. And this was as a result of the fact that there was no desire within their hearts to actually enter into truth. So this is why Jesus told parables. He was telling the parables to conceal so that only the desperate will be able to unlock it. My brother, when you begin to deal with God, you will find out that messages from the realm of God come in layers of access. There are certain messages that will come from the realm of God, they will come with encryption codes. So if you don't have access at that level, no matter how emotional you get, you will not, you will not break the code. This is why the Bible says that it is the Spirit of God that reveals the things of God. Yea, even what? The deep things. So it means that there are layers. 
They are the things of God and they are what? The deep things. That is matters of access. It's encryption. It's encryption. So when you want to begin to deal with deep things, there is an access level that is required. There are possibilities that are open to individuals who take their work with God very seriously that they are willing to make the sacrifices that matches the demand for such access. So everybody can be alive in a generation. Only few people will have their ears working. I remember telling you whether it was on Thursday or on Friday, I can't remember which, that one of the things that God must give to us as a generation is the spirit of discernment. Hearing eyes, seeing ears. Because at that level of discernment, what God does for you is that you are able to break encryptions. You can tell that this thing is of God and this thing is not of God. You know the things that we celebrate in the body of Christ? Somebody looks at you and says, your address is 44. Oh God, did you lose your address? You forgot where you stay? Even a witch doctor can tell you your address. You don't need, you don't need to be full of the Holy Ghost and power to tell that address. If you walk into a shrine now, I don't know how the shrines in are in Ghana. But in certain parts of my nation, which doctors are so powerful that they can do the kind of things that we can't even do in church. They are very powerful. So you can even visit a witch doctor and he can tell you what your mother was wearing the day she gave birth to you. Even your mother has forgotten. So if those are the kinds of information that you celebrate, it means that you can easily be deceived by a man who does not know Jesus. And as sad as it sounds, that is, those are the things we use to validate who is a prophet. Things that exist at the minimal, minimum access level. That's minimum access. I, I assure you that if you get serious with God, eh, my brother, and you do one hour tongues in the morning before you go to work, when you come back in the evening before you put food in your belly, you do one hour tongues, the books of your destiny will open. They will open. You will not need somebody to tell you uh, when you become 35, this will happen. God will, will visit you in the night. He will show you. If you do that thing for two months, you'll be a walking router. If you enter into a place and you touch somebody's hands, God will show you things about the person's life. You'll be a walking router. But when it comes to certain deep issues, God will, is not emotional to release them to you because you do not cast your pearls. First one. Value is a matter. So let's go back to our scripture. So what Jesus was telling there was a parable. He was telling a story. And the reason for telling that story was that he wanted to communicate a spiritual truth. Are we still together? Now it's at the end of that discourse that he tells us what the spiritual truth is. Let's go to verse, uh -huh, verse 32. He says, For John came to you in the way of righteousness. Holy Spirit, help me. So what is the way of righteousness? The way of righteousness is, what, what Jesus was saying here is, John came to you emphasizing the need for living right. The way of righteousness is the way of right living. If you've listened to me since I came on Friday, I've been trying to, on Thursday, I've been trying to emphasize to you that in this kingdom, as a Christian, there's no lawlessness. You're not allowed to live the way you like. In this kingdom, yes, your will is still your will. What God gave to mortal man is a gift that even Satan does not have right over. It's a gift. And that gift is the power to choose. You know that Satan can't force you to choose anything. Oh. I feel for those people who have been lying against Satan in this realm. In my, in my, in my country, they say that Satan is soaking your cane in kerosene. He's waiting for you. Anything you do, you say it's the devil. The devil. Some people, by the time it, God should not allow them to get to hellfire because their own drilling will be different. All the times they lied against Satan, Satan will make sure that he fries them in hot 
hot oil. Because the most that Satan can do is suggest. That's the most Satan can do. He can suggest. That's the most. For instance, as a young man, you're walking on the road and a naked, half-naked girl is walking past you. Satan will, will suggest to you. Did you see that naked girl? Then you will now, you now need to say, I didn't see. I didn't see. But what the young man does is that he now, he now agrees with Satan that there's a naked girl. Then Satan now says, oh yeah, look now. Then he now turns and looks. Seeing can be accidental. Looking is always intentional. It's true. Don't be angry with me, bro. Don't be angry. You will not meet anybody on the road, on the road, and he's shouting, Reverend Isaac, help me. My neck is turning by itself. He's turning by itself. I don't want my neck to turn. No, nobody. If the neck ever turned, you turned it. Satan won't turn your neck. You don't need a miracle to stop your neck from turning. You just need the act of your will. God has given you the power to choose. So Satan can't force you. Even God cannot force you. God cannot force you to choose him. God cannot force you to sacrifice your best for him. He can only put promptings in your spirit. If you know the communications of the Holy Ghost, there are things called promptings. There are things called nudgings. There are things called impressions. There are things called burdens. These are communications of the spirit. That's how he talks to us. You know, many of you think the reason you are not, you are confused in basic things of knowing the voice of God is the average Christian is waiting to hear God as he's hearing my voice. Francis, Francis, don't wear that black shoe. So you, you ask him, do you hear God's voice? He says, no. He's waiting for the, the audible voice. The truth is that in your walk with God, hearing the audible voice of God may not happen more than five, six times in your entire life. When you hear a preacher say, I know that there's someone here, God just told me there's someone here, what he's telling you is, he has mastered the way God speaks to him. So he knows. For instance, if I'm in a meeting and I begin to feel like a hand on top of my head here, I know how that meeting is going to end. I know when that thing came. And anytime I feel it, I know that it is a sign that God's presence is intense. And he has come to break specific yokes. So if I say, God is here, it's not necessarily because I saw him physically. It's because I know how he communicates. How he communicates. All right? So there is no lawlessness in this kingdom. There is a way to live. A way to live. And you must determine that by an of your will, you will choose the way of righteousness. So when John came, he, he cried out that you need to bring forth fruit of repentance. It's not enough to say, I have repented. The proof that you repented it should show in your living. Sweet and bitter water cannot come out of the same fountain. A tree is known by its fruit. That's why you call it mango tree. The tree is conditioned by the fruit that it bears. So if the fruit is corrupt, it is enough to know that the tree is corrupt. There's no excuse. If what we see you producing out of your life, if we see the way you are living on a daily basis, we will know whether you know the way of righteousness or not. It's our Father and the Lord that told us that a spiritual man must be righteously strict to himself. It's the way of righteousness. You need to live right. Live right. Choose right. In a world where there are many options, you will need to choose God every time. That's the sign of maturity. You're not mature because you have been in church for many years. One of the signs of maturity is when you are faced with multiple options every time you choose God. You never choose an alternative. You choose God every time. You choose God. So he said, John came to you in the way of righteousness. And you did not believe him. But 
tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. I like the way the old King James puts it. He says, you did not regret. So what was Jesus saying here? He was saying that this parable of two sons that I'm telling you represent two kinds of people. The first set of people are the people who are the Pharisees. The religious order. Remember that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what they metamorphically represent in scripture is the religious order of that day. This is why the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to John the Baptist where? In the wilderness. It bypassed the religious order of the day and went to the new move in the wilderness. So even though a system already existed, God could not use that system to bring the new. This is why the Bible says that if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it out. He's not saying that you should go and give yourself short sleeve or long sleeve. What he's saying is that once you find corruption, the only way to deal with corruption is to cut it out. So you find a guy that speaks in tongues, he's calling you at odd hours of the night. And then when he calls you, he first of all speaks, you know brothers are dangerous. Brothers, hmm. I was one of those kind of brothers, so I know what I'm saying. Dangerous. He will call you at odd hours of the night. He will now first spiritualize it and speak tongues. I know some brothers, their tongues are like Queen's English. Ferwantifala <laughs> kiasya. Then from there, he starts telling you all kinds of nonsense that will not allow you to sleep in the night. Then you are calling your pastors to say, this brother is disturbing me. What should I do? Cut it off. The reason you are asking what should I do is that there is a part of you that is enjoying it. He's enjoying it. I don't want him to feel bad. Auntie, so it's you. You, 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 you. you want him to be happy. But your life should be at stake. The only way to deal with corruption once it has begun, once it has begun, it must be dealt with. So Jesus could not use the old order. As merciful as he is, he went to the new move, put the, brought his word to John the Baptist in the wilderness. That was their anger, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had expected that when the Messiah comes, he will come and show himself to them and say, I don't come home. Then say, hey, let us introduce you. They will not take him on excursion with their gowns and their robes, so they'll be going from street to street and say, we bring to you the Messiah. They wanted that recognition. So their pain was that, how could God bypass them and start a new move and they are not involved in it? That was the anger. So on one hand, there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious system. On the other hand, were the harlots, the tax collectors, the ones who the world has condemned. These ones, when they came to him, they believed the teaching of John the Baptist and they began to walk with the Lord. Now, God was expecting that those people's behavior will be a teaching moment for the religious system. But rather than them learn from the Pharisees and, and, and from the harlots, the tax collectors, the Pharisees and Sadducees were hardened. They refused to relent. So, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the second son, the harlots, the tax collectors, and those who have been condemned are the first son. Or they are the, no, the harlots, the tax collectors are the second son. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are supposed to be the first son. So unlike the first son that changed his mind after a while and decided to follow, these ones refused to change their mind. They refused to repent. And you know the intriguing thing about this? Is when I was reading this again for this meeting, the second son actually said, I go, sir. 
but he never went. If there is one thing that God wants you to take from this my visit to Ghana, is that it is not enough to start. <laughs> Bro, there is no place in scripture where a man is rewarded for starting. No place. What's up? He says, it's when you endure to the end, you'll be saved. The reward is always for finishing. There is no place in scripture where a man is rewarded because he started. Because it's possible to say, I go, sir. And yet he never moves. Never grows. Never becomes responsible. Never touches anything in God. He gets to a point where by an act of his own will, he decides to turn away from Jesus. An act of his own will. You know the thing called fornication? It's not an accident. Though. Say, I, 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 Daddy, I fell into sin. You fell. You fell. As in you fell from the roof. You fell. Fell. Bro, do you know that as I came to Ghana now, and I want to fall? Hmm. You know, where me and, me and my brother are staying, when we enter the place, eh, I need to climb stairs. The first one is about 10, if I counted correctly. The second one is about 10. So at least 20 stairs to reach my room. So if I'm going to fall, eh, I first of all need to call the girl and make sure that Rev is not around. You know the strategic planning to make sure he's not around. <laughs> I even have to, I can even come up with something and say, Mama Mary said I should tell you that you should come to the house. Or if I don't want to do that, I'll say, I want to eat fufu, Ghana fufu. And I want you to bring it for me. So I now, I've now first of all told a lie. So he will leave. Then I'll now need to call the sister. She will now come. Meanwhile, I will now go outside to show her the place. I will now climb through 20 stairs. Hmm? Then when I carry her at the door, we will now climb up again 20 stairs. I will now open the door. Be counting the steps, so, but the person said, they what? They fell. Then you entered inside the house. This my trouser has belt, has button, has zip. Wait first now, stay. So I have to remove the belt, do the button, remove the zip, and still do like this. <laughs> eh? And the person said, the what? He fell. In all these steps, not once did the Holy Ghost prick your heart to say, Kesena, what are you doing? No, he was there all the while. You willfully wanted to sin. It was an act of your will. You had determined that that day you must chop suya. <laughs> you had determined. You, you, you see, as a Christian, you can't even tell a lie. You know when the Bible says that he that is born of God cannot sin because the seed of God is in him. It doesn't mean that sin has died. It means that sin has lost its potency. Sin no longer has power over you. So if you want to sin, you have to decide to sin. It doesn't have power. When you were in Egypt, sin had utmost power over you. You were a slave. You could not say yes or no. But the minute you arrive at Zion, like my brother was saying just now, there is deliverance. One of the mighty deliverances you experience is that you are delivered from the power of sin. It's when we get to heaven, we'll be delivered from the presence of sin. That's what's called glorification. Sin still exists everywhere. So the Bible says, every man is tempted. Every man. Every man is tempted. It's still there everywhere. But you will not have to decide that I don't want it. It loses its capacity to draw you to itself. 
So, and this thing I'm telling you is in scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, give me 26. I think it's 26. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. If we sin, what? Are you seeing that? After we have received what? The knowledge of the truth. There no longer remains what? Sacrifice. My sister, you know what that means? It means that after you have received the knowledge of the truth, the only way you can sin is how? Being fully. So somebody who is a Christian says, uh, they were sharing stolen money in the, in, 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 the, in the office and Satan made me take it. No, it's not Satan. You wanted stolen money. So you allowed yourself to be implicated in the way of deception, the way of lust. You refuse to walk in the way of righteousness. Hi, Melofanakaya. The first day I saw that scripture that Jesus used to teach, I sat down for long and called myself to a meeting. He says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that walk therein. But that's not the instruction. He says, narrow is the way that leads to life. Few find it. That was the question I kept asking. Only few find it. There's a deliberate movement in the right direction that happens in a man's life for him to walk the way of righteousness. You will choose during these elections in Nigeria, they were sharing dollars to people who were collation agents and all those kind of things, like water. The amount of dollars can solve somebody's problem. You know now, your biggest burden is, oh, I don't have money. You are opening, you are opening yourself up. Satan knows that there is a secret lost in your heart that he can take advantage of. When one of my sons, who was one of the people working for, for the INEC, or, um, INEC, he sent me a message. When he mentioned the amount of money, I said, Jesus is love. In dollars. And the funny thing is, he was telling his fellow people who were Christians that I cannot take. They were coming to ask him, why? See, it's not, it's not bribe now. They just want to appreciate us for a work well done, or God. It's not bribe. That's how we have raised thieves. Thieves. Willfully going out of the way of righteousness. Because there's a craving they want to satisfy. My sister, every time you do this, Hebrew says that you crucify the Son are fresh. Are fresh. Do you know the pain that Jesus feels when one of his sons under pressure chooses to, by an act of their will, rejects him and chooses Satan. Do you know the pain he feels? You will not know the weight of the pain he feels until you read the book of Job. Bro, did you see how he boasted about Job to Satan? And the, the thing I love about the book of Job is that Job was not even aware. I love Job. But see, Job was not an actor. He wasn't pretending. He lived his life like that on a daily basis. His children would go and do party. He will wake up in the morning, carry a sacrifice to the Lord's altar, lie there, and say, Lord, I know in the multitude of words they can be seen. It's possible my children have committed sin. Have mercy. He was a priest over his house. Go to the average Christian home now. The woman is the priest. Is the, is the order has been distorted. Some of you that have grown old, you know that it's your mothers that spent all the time teaching you the way of Jesus. Your father got lost trying to make money. 
And you may not believe me, but that's why certain things were able to access your family. The priest gate must be manned by the head of the home. The way it's designed. But many men have abandoned their priestly office to their wives. So the woman is the one who is the gatekeeper of the home. He's wrong. Job didn't do that. In fact, the only time they came to mention Job's wife was because of a bad thing. In all the other matters, it's only Job you saw. He was the priest. He was the teacher. He was God's man in the earth. And God, Satan, Satan didn't ask, oh, my brother, go and read it. Satan didn't ask. Satan came for a meeting as usual. It was monthly AGM meeting. <laughs> huh? So Satan appeared at the AGM. And God said, ah, Oga, you come? I said, yes, sir, I come. Oh. I said, where are you doing since? I said, I've been going to and fro the earth. He said, ah, ah, you went to the earth. So you left the second heavens and went to the earth. I said, yes. I said, okay, if you went to the earth, you must have seen my precious jewel. Have you considered my servant Job? What kind of thing is that? It was God that decided to put Job in trouble. Can you imagine? Job's problem started because God was proud of him. God was proud of him. So imagine how it would be if it was Satan that appeared there. There's a reason he's called the accuser of the brethren. If he had appeared there and he said, is it not Kesena? He's the one that would have even brought report to the Lord. To say, look at your son whom you, you think is something. Every time I present him an opportunity, he rejects you. He loves you as a father only in lip service. Not in the way of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how God's heart breaks? A bishop in my city raped a 13-year-old on his altar. On his altar. And you know the thing about God? He's omnipresent. There's nothing you do that is done outside of his eyes. You, you, you like go under the earth. You can't hide from his eyes. So imagine the kind of I saw a bishop presented to the Lord. An I saw. I read that scripture in Proverbs. I can't remember where it is. It says that the ways of a man are constantly before the eyes of the Lord. And I vowed that Lord, when you look upon my ways, I will not give you the wrong thing to see. The ways of a man are, he didn't say temporarily, they are constantly before the eyes of the Lord. So sometimes, sons and daughters are giving unto the Lord all kinds of pictures that bring a wound a wound to his heart. See, dear brother, if the Bible says that God can be angry, if the Bible says that God can be jealous, it also means that God can weep. So it means, therefore, that it is possible for a generation to be alive and all God is doing over that generation is what? Weeping. Hi. There's a story in Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah 5. The Bible says, I planted a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. And then I came expecting to receive grapes. But when I came there, I saw that it produced wild grapes. Do you know that from time to time, God comes to check our lives like that? What is he looking for? Fruit. It's called the way of righteousness. He's looking for fruit. He wants to see that your life is beginning to bear witness of the things that are happening in your inner man. 
That the Holy Ghost that you received is not only tongues he gave you. He gave you capacity to produce the fruit of God. Me, I don't know. I don't know. They say I'm a bad man. But I can't understand how somebody with, one, with the same tongue will say I love you and can't stop lying. I don't understand it. There was a time in my nation that if they wanted to employ people, they went to a certain denomination. They said, if this person is from this denomination, you can be sure of their character. You can be sure of their integrity. There will be people of truth. Now you are even afraid to do business with a fellow believer. Fellow believer. You dare not sleep in the house of a brother that speaks in tongues. He can rape you in the night. And then he will turn and say it's the devil. What I'm trying to say to you today is that if you are one of his sons, by an act of your will, you must choose the way of righteousness. You must choose the way of righteousness. Those days of us trying to pamper ourselves and call the things weakness, and it's just, look bro, sit down, tell yourself the truth. You don't love God enough to reject Satan. If you love God enough, every time you are presented with options, you will choose God. And you see, as we wrap up this weekend that has been so sweet and so rich, I've been blessed. I've been blessed. I go back to listen to my own teachings. As we wrap up, let there be a sincere determination in your heart that for as long as you are drawing breath in this economy, you will never break God's heart. How does a, an immortal boast to Satan about a weak man? Do you know that man is frail? Man is nothing. A minute is here, the next minute he's gone. The Bible says like a flower, he fades. There is hope for a tree if it is cut down at the scent of water to a body again. But it says man is not like that. The day he dies, he dies. Man is free. But the great immortal spirit was boasting about a man. What did Job find? That kept him. You see, we have something that is greater than whatever Job had. What we have is Holy Ghost. We have Holy Ghost. We have Holy Ghost. But what my generation has done with Holy Ghost has reduced him to tongues. Tongues are excellent. But the most important thing the Holy Ghost comes to do for you is that he gives you capacity. Capacity. Notice, dear brother, I want to start teaching now. Notice that when the father came to the two sons, he didn't ask them, can you go to my vineyard? Are you with me? He assumed that they had capacity to walk in the vineyard. And that assumption, God doesn't make assumptions baselessly. God's conclusions and his assumptions are always based upon facts. So for him to be putting that kind of expectation upon his sons is because he knew that they had capacity to walk in the vineyard. He will not ask them to do anything that he did not know that they were able to do. That would be witchcraft. In management circles, we say that that is setting somebody up to fail. You know the person, you know your subordinate cannot do the work. But because she's a girl that you are asking out and she's saying she's a Christian, you now give her a job she cannot do. That's witchcraft. So that when she fails, you now have 
something to present to the man and say she doesn't know how to walk or gosh she's not trained for it you set the person up to fail god doesn't do that so the, the, the father came to both sons whether first son or last son he came to both sons on the basis of the fact that he knew that they could labor in the fire you see dear brother dear sister the problem of the christian is not a matter of capacity the minute you are joined to christ the matter of capacity is already settled let's look at matthew chapter 9 35 you remember that story matthew chapter 9 and 35 the bible says that jesus after seeing the multitudes he was moved to compassion he said they were like sheep without shepherd then he began to talk about the harvest as to how the harvest was ripe then he says something that is critical he said but the laborers a few who are laborers people who can work in the harvest jesus did not say the harvest is ripe and men are few there was a quality of men he was talking about men can be plenty in a generation but laborers are few and you may not like the preacher but the truth is if you go to our congregations on a sunday morning it's full of men there are no laborers There are no men you can send into the harvest. They are known. They don't even care about the harvest. Talk less of sending them. They don't even know how to use a sickle. You think it's everybody that can harvest corn? You think it's everybody that can harvest rice? You put somebody who does not know how to harvest farm products in the farm, he will kill all your products. Somebody has been in church for 15 years, he does not know the way of God. He has not been trained, not been taught. All he comes to do every Sunday, every week, is to shout, I receive. Meanwhile, those who are serving Satan, there's a rigorous training system. If you become a witch today, they have a program for you to become a master witch in two years. So a three-year-old can be a witch and enter a family of a pastor and kill everybody. She's three years old. She can't even speak, speak three. She can't speak three. Her tongue is still bent. She has not learnt words. But she will kill everybody, including the pastor. Because the day she became a witch, they didn't start pampering her. Grace this, grace that. They started training. It was us, our generation, and the generation of our fathers, that turned the house of God into a place of enjoyment. In the days of the apostles, it was a place of training. It was a cantonment. When you got born again, you were trained. That's why when persecution broke out, the Bible says everywhere they went, they were like military men. They were under persecution. No, they should have been running to hide. But if they arrived at somewhere, what they came was with Holy Ghost. They came with the message. Let persecution break out now. People will be entering caves. But in their day, they were so trained that even on that person, they were running with their bags. But if they got to a city, they would stop first and share gospel. So the word of Jesus was spreading even under persecution. Conflict arose in, among them. This one said, I've not eaten. You know, they are using, using wayo to share the food. Peter didn't say, let's go and import people from outside. Skilled people. You know that's what we do now. Somebody wants to start ministry. He puts a banner on Facebook says he's looking for volunteers. <laughs> they didn't say let's go and it's because we don't we don't know the way of training. We want ready made, ready made. Food is ready. Give me meat pie and donut or ga. The way of the apostles. Was a way of training. He said, choose from amongst you. Men full of the Holy Spirit to whom we can commit this business. Choose from amongst you. 
It's not, it's not once, it's not twice. Me and my brother have been talking, he has been speaking about the choir. You know the joy of a preacher? That people under your hand, you can trace their spiritual journey. And say, this one came like this. But see the way the person is now. The Bible says there was a woman under the influence of the spirit of infirmity. She was bent. She could in no wise raise herself up, but a son of order appeared. People come into our churches bent. They die bent. Nobody ever raises them up. The way they come is the way they die. We even do their burial and sing hymns. Meanwhile, heaven is weeping. That this one lived for 15 years, no impact, no knowledge of God. You can't work with Satan if, if, if you don't get to know him. So people who are in the negative supernatural, they are committed to training, committed to discipleship. My generation likes messages that tell them that God is coming with hamper. And as I woke up this morning, I saw three revelations. God was carrying a golden hamper. The name written on it was Kesena. Then he was carrying a silver hamper. The name on it was Angela. He was carrying a bronze hamper. The name on it was Isaac. Say, take your hamper now. Take hamper by fire. I receive. <laughs> so we have received many things, but there are no laborers in the field. All of us want to work in oil and gas companies. All of us want to sit, sit in a bank with a tie. All of us want to look fancy and beautiful. While, meanwhile, the mission fields are crying. People are dying. When we were getting born again, young men were selling their lives to go and serve Jesus. Parents used to cry, you are my only son. Say, Jesus has called me. My brother shocked me which day. He was telling me that he has not even gone back to his university to collect his certificate. But it's that certificate you, you are pursuing that has made you damage your prayer life. Say, I came to school to study. Oh, please, please, I came to study, study. <laughs> Meanwhile, some other people have gone to that campus and they have a track record with Jesus and they still graduated with first class. You will come out and enter the, the queue to get a job like everybody else. Meanwhile, what was written concerning you in eternity is that you are a missionary. You waste 25 years working in a man's company. Let it not be that it's two years before you die that you find out that you were in the wrong place. By that time, only two years, it will be too late. You may not even have strength again to get up and go. Samson said, I will arise as usual. He wist not. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers. So in that statement, Jesus makes an assumption that there are already men somewhere whom have grown to a stature where they can be called what? Laborers. If such men did not exist, Jesus would not have been saying, pray the God of the harvest. You know, I need to ask you today, what kind of person are you? Are you a laborer? Can God send you? Can he send you like this? I tell my people back in worry that the reason some of you have not received your visas, even though your destiny is in another place, it's because God is not sending you there to look for money. He's sending you there as a laborer. But if you go like this, money will become your God. And God is not emotional. He will keep you here. Walking here. If you do not shift into that stature of a laborer, you will die here. Pray the God of the harvest. That he will send laborers. Men are laboring freely for Satan. They labor for him with their lives. We can't find enough people that are willing to labor for Jesus. One of the things that has wounded the body of Christ in my generation is this thing called comfort. 
comfort, the quest for comfort. And I'm not against comfort. God has blessed me a little. I'm not against comfort. But some of you, the reason you have lost touch with the reality of the spirit is that you have become comfortable. When you did not have mattress and you were sleeping on the floor, your prayer life was functioning. The day you bought mattress, you can't pray again. When you could not eat, you built a regime around your life. Now that you can eat three times a day, lust has become your friend every week. Comfort. And you see, that's not what I'm teaching now. The day the Lord permits me to teach it, I will show you in the Bible there is nothing like comfortable Christianity. Your Christianity must be costing you something. If it's not costing you anything, it is fake. It's fake. So in the matter of the two sons, the father's concern was not a matter of capacity. Why? The minute you are joined to the Lord, capacity is provided. Romans chapter 8, I think it's verse 9. It says that if anyone have not the spirit of God, it's none of his. What does that mean, my brother? It means that when you get born again, there's a deposit you receive. It's called Holy Ghost. That's the greatest gift God gives to a believer. Himself. There's a dimension of God that you carry. And the whole essence of that dimension of God is to bring you into an economy whereby you are now immune to the things that are happening around you. Attractions, distractions. They can't find a, a place in your, in your civilization. The Holy Ghost begins to work his work on your inside. It is by him you are able to will and to do. According to what? His good pleasure. So when lust is staring you at the face, his life will kick in on your inside and say, you are not that man. The capacity is there. And what is capacity? Capacity is the maximum amount that something can contain. If you use English, the maximum amount. So we can say um, the capacity of this hall is 5,000 people. That's the maximum amount. But capacity is also the amount of something the amount that something can produce. The amount that something can produce. So you can say, the, the capacity of this microphone is 85 decibels. You know, measure sound in decibels. So you say the capacity of this microphone is 85 decibels. That's the amount it can produce. And you see, when, we, when you apply that to the human life, the mortal man, your spirit has capacity. There's, a, there, there's something it can contain. When God met that madman of gatherings, out of him came over 6,000 demons. That's how large your spirit is. When those demons were cast out, one pig could not contain it. it, it they had to go into a head. That's what one human was carrying. Hmm. As large as your spirit is, how much of God dwells there? How much of his waters have you drank? How much of him have you experienced in the largeness of your spirit? Is it not because there are certain dimensions of your spirit that are still tied to the attractions and the distractions of this world? So there's not even space for God anymore. The other dimension of capacity is that there is an amount that you can produce. He said to them that receive the Holy Ghost, they that receive the Holy Ghost, to them he gave power. He said you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Power. And you know when the average young person reads that scripture, the power they emphasize it. Power. Forgetting that that power is not only miraculous. That power is what also gives you the opportunity to choose the way of righteousness. It's the Holy Spirit that helps you to walk pure. 
is the Holy Spirit that helps you to stay separate. And this morning, where I want to take you to is where you will cry, Holy Ghost. If you don't give me all of you, I, I don't want to go on this journey like this. Why should I go alone? Why? Why? When capacity has already been provided. Bro, prayer is hard. But it's only hard for them that don't know the way of the spirit. There's a way called the way of the spirit. There's a way. There's a way called the way of the spirit. There are days you will wake up. Like I woke up this morning. I wanted to do my normal clock in my normal time of prayer. I woke up. I was tired. But I said, let me just begin. I began. I began. That's how you do it. After a while, the Holy Ghost will kick in and say, yes, bro, I'm here. I'm here. Beloved, I'm here. Now, before you know, you are flying. You are flying. That you now, by an act of your will, have to shut the prayer down. Because you need to do other things. It's called the way of the Spirit. The Father did not say, I don't know whether you can walk. Oh. I don't know whether you know how to clear the vineyard. He said, go and walk. Because if you have received the Holy Ghost, there shouldn't be limitations. There shouldn't be, there shouldn't be, there shouldn't be uh, 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 excuses. Or God, the reason you don't like the Bible is because you've not given the Holy Spirit free hand. Bro, he will damage your appetites. He will make you want God. You are in a bus going home. And the Holy Spirit will just begin to, to walk on your inside. Have you been in conversations with him before? And you have to be fighting back the tears in public. Have you loved him so much? That he is the one now encouraging you. Leave, leave. You say, no, I want to die. I don't want to be here anymore. Have you loved him to the point where you have lost interest in life? And all you want is do with me as it pleases you. Do with me as it pleases you. Ah. Years ago, one of the prayers that the Lord taught me to pray that helped my life was teach me how to love you, Holy Ghost. Teach me how to love you. I want to love you. I want to love you. But now my generation is crying about capacity. The matter is not capacity. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The reason it looks like you are incapable is that you have not given the Holy Spirit his rightful place. If he takes his place, you will know that you are stronger than you look. You're not as weak as you think. He said, I don't know why I can't stop my spirit. Oh God, give him his place. Three times Paul cried. He said, take this tongue from me. God did as if he was not hearing on the third time, say, oh God, my grace. There's enough. There's enough there. It's sufficient. You can stop stealing. I don't know who the young lady is. While I was taking my bath, I had entered into the bathroom, just stealing the atmosphere of the spirit. And then I began to hear from afar. At first, I didn't understand what it means. I see you. I see you I see you it was getting louder in my spirit so I had to I had to stop I said Lord what is this one he said go and tell one of my daughters she thinks she's invisible she feels as if she's forgotten he said I should tell you I see you even if men it looks as if you you don't make any meaning to anybody he said I should tell you I see you I see you many of you what you are crying for is not lost is domiciled within your spirit but you have not built a relationship with him this is why Benny Hinn wrote a book called good morning holy spirit simple practical wake up in the morning and say good morning holy spirit 
I remember the first time I read that book, I was a teenager. And I was wondering how a man could just wake up, read the book, and then the presence of God would just flood his room. I was like, what, what, is this the magic? My brother, it's practice. Many of us talk to Jesus, talk to the Father, but we've abandoned the Holy Ghost. Meanwhile, he's the one that is here. He's the one that was left for your comfort. He's the one that was released to be your guide. How have you been surviving without him? If your guide, you have abandoned him. How, have you, how, did, how did you enter that relationship? How did you choose that course to study in the university? If your guide, you abandon him. It means that it is easy to say that where you are now, you led yourself there. And my brother, the challenge of leading yourself in this journey is that if you lead yourself, you will need to sustain yourself. If he leads you, he will provide supply. There are things called the supply of grace. There are things called the supply of power. There are things called the supply of resources. I was telling you yesterday, you will get to a point in this your Christian life before you cry for a need. And you will not even be a big preacher. Before you cry for a need, God will afflict someone somewhere. Say, send my son money. Send my son money. What's the name of that missionary now? Andrew. It's not Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray is a South African. Um, but he was a missionary. He had, he had a, a home for boys in UK. Eh? George Muller. George Muller. Thank you. George Muller. I read his biography. And I went to ask God. God, you are Pasha. He said he prayed prayers. None of his prayers were unanswered. None. He never prayed a prayer that did not receive an answer. None. George Muller, none. They come and tell him, there's no bread. What are the boys going to eat? He says, put the plates on the table. Bread is coming. Before they can say Jack Robinson, the baker, the, the village baker or the city baker, arrives at the door and says, oh, God will not give me rest. And he brought bread. They say, but are we going to eat dry bread? What about sardine? Or... <laughs> and he says, don't worry. The milkman in the city is driving back. An angel went and removed the wheel of the truck. The, the truck now breaks right in front of the orphanage. It breaks down there. While the man is struggling with the, the wheel, the Lord tells him the milk is for that place. He goes and carries the milk inside. You, you have denied Jesus in your heart many times because you didn't have money. You don't know that there's a realm. There's a realm. You see, brethren, these are the kind of things I pray for. Many times I've told the Lord, I'm still walking not because I'm afraid that you can't take care of me. But because you have not told me it's time. This is the way I want to live, Kesena. This, this is the way I want my story to be told. That any time I wanted anything, God sent it. That's the kind of story I want to be I want to tell. When you know the capacity you have, you can't steal your company's money. You will not sleep with a boy because he wants to give you a recharge card or he wants to pay your school fees. You hear Christian guys say, it's hey, hey, only my mother taking care of her. Hey, hey. He suffers. Suffer. Auntie, I know people. At least I'm in a higher institution. That's where I lecture. They will rather drop out of school than sell their body. They will rather go and plate hair. But we have people who are speaking in tongues. Little pressure, they cave. because they've not built capacity. Let me read one last scripture. Judges chapter 8. Oh, he's the whole Holy Ghost. Just be playing that for me. I need to hear that lead guitar. The way I'm feeling now, home in Lamaquata. Give me verse 20. You see, this morning service is a self-help service. Now what I mean is, God will respond to you on the basis of your hunger. There are 
dimensions of the spirit that are going to be quickened in your life after now people who have maximized this capacity they can't be blind they can't be blind I say this with all humility all humility God sees my heart if I miss something my wife will catch it nothing takes us on our ways some people were misbehaving 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 ah I slept like this God showed me their life and how they wanted to leave us and how they wanted to cause pain I had not seen that in two days my wife received it you can't be blind the reason you are confused the reason you are looking at other people who are serving Satan and you are envying what they have is that you don't know you have capacity you don't know Jesus said because I've told you these things now you are sorrowful he said but it is better for you that I go for if I don't go I will not send Alos Paracletus it's better for you that I go because as I go I will send the Holy Ghost I don't know the brother I need to tell bro fall in love with the Holy Ghost love him love him pursue him young man like you will pursue a maiden that you have loved pursue him learn his ways yield to his notions allow him to condition your life if he tells you i don't like this thing don't ask him why don't look for an explanation I don't want you in that place don't say why say yes sir that's how you walk with the holy ghost because you'll be keeping records of your obedience and every time you obey you gain stature your physical nature might not be changing but you are that capacity of your spirit that is large you are growing in your spirit growing in your spirit growing in your spirit so when the day of adversity comes you cannot faint Bible says if you faint in the day of adversity your strength is small it's not because the, the enemy was strong it was not a matter of the enemy it was a matter of your capacity Gideon had gone to battle with his 300 you remember Gideon's 300 they had gone to battle in fact if you read this Judges chapter 8 I'm watching the time my time is almost done if you read this Judges, the Bible says him and his 300 were exhausted they were tired i don't know how jetta jetta is gideon's son i don't know how he entered the equation probably by the time his father came home with the 300 he decided to follow him as a prince he was a son so he followed his father into battle because he's not one of the 300. now they chase the kings of midian they chase them even though the army was exhausted they chase them until they caught them and when he got to that point, Gideon, probably because he was exhausted, now looked at his son, who was a prince. His firstborn. He said, rise! Kill them. Gideon was making the same assumption that Jesus made. Why? He believed that his son should have capacity. Part of the training for a prince in the palace was not how to sit down, how to eat, Apart from all those trainings, every prince was trained as a warrior. Because the king was the one that led God's people into battle. It was kings that led armies. In fact, one of the ways to show your valor as a king was that you will win battles. So Gideon assumed that Jetta had been training that Jetta had been attending his practices that his men the soldiers have been teaching Jetta how to fight Jetta had a sword you look at him you say what a strong man he's his father's son but the day came and he said draw your sword he said but the youth will not draw his sword why he was afraid they don't hide fear on the face 
the day you will know that there is something in your spirit that satan has capacity to use against you is in the day that you face temptation or in the day of your warfare he was a youth and if you hear it you say oh the small boy why would his father carry a small boy to battle go and read the kings the bible says goliath was a man of war from his youth The way they trained boys in those days, from the young age, especially if you were born in a palace, you were taught warfare. His father would not have asked him to draw his sword if it was not normal for youths to know how to wield the weapon. May it not be that God calls upon you and he says, draw your sword and fear. But you see what I like about that story that we began with is that even though the firstborn, this is where I want to end. Even though he first all said, I'm not going. I don't know what happened when his father turned his back. Huh. This is why you must be one with the Holy Spirit. I don't know what happened. What happened in his heart? What happened in his mind? The Bible says he regretted. And he went. Can you imagine the father coming back, seeing the vineyard cleared, thinking that it was his younger son, only to hear that is the one who said no before that has come. My brother, you can say yes today. If you've squandered your chances with the Holy Ghost, He has given you opportunities before, and you threw it away, you can repent today. It's never too late to begin again. The only time it becomes late is when it has ended. Smith Wigglesworth did not begin ministry until he was 50 years old. 50 years old. Bro, I refuse to be alive and have Holy Ghost and not maximize him. I refuse. I will learn his ways. And I do not preach to you as one who was attained. I'm in the school of the spirit. I'm learning. I'm going. I'm begging him every day. Holy Spirit, will you not help me? I want to get to the point where I don't need to tell stories. If I meet a Muslim on the road, all I want to give him is a handshake and let him come under conviction. When we're younger, they'll be telling you, don't eat food outside. Oh. Don't eat food outside. Oh. Don't eat food outside. They can, witches can transfer witchcraft if they give you sweet. We will have Holy Ghost. They touch us, they eat our food, nothing happens. And yet, if you meet us on the road, we'll say that we have the greater power, we have the higher authority. Which is if a witch enters here now and she wants to damage a woman's pregnancy, she can sit on a chair and get up. If the woman sits there, the baby will come out. How many times have you gone to campus? and lay down on your roommate's bed and got up and the person lay there and woke up speaking in tongues if you sell anything in the market they should buy what you sell and touch holy ghost you shake somebody's hand their heart should begin to burn but my generation does not know holy ghost we look like we don't have capacity it's a lie the problem is a matter of engagement. We have not engaged him. We've not loved him enough to pay the price to find him. Oh, he's the whole Holy Ghost, Spirit of the Living God. Oh, he's the whole Holy Ghost. King of kings, I'm an acopela man. He's the whole Holy Ghost, Spirit of the Ancient God. The sweet in everything. Oh, in a fierce man. Wait a minute, listen, listen. See, see, I'm not trying to be emotional. If you don't feel like praying, you have my permission to sit down. Now, my brother told me when I need to close. So I'm going to give you five minutes. 
Five minutes. And then, God said I should lay hands on people today. So, I will enter into the congregation. There are some of you I don't need to touch. Just need to touch. He told me about a young man who is struggling with the spirit of anxiety. Anxiety. You are anxious. Fear wants to kill you. The fear of your future. You keep feeling as if you will amount to nothing. I came with something for you. I came. I came with something for you. I came with something for you. I came with something for you. When it's time to pray, these five minutes, forget who is by your side. Forget. Beg the Holy Ghost. The choir is going to do that song seven times. Seven times. If you are singing it, sing it from your spirit. But I will encourage you to pray. If you are baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, pray like you have never prayed before. Rat tool in your spirit. You want to engage that capacity that is lying in your belly.